Good evening. I'm Mark Sargent, uh, Provost at Westmont College, and it's a delight to welcome you to our, our special Westmont Downtown Lecture this evening. We're grateful that you joined us on this occasion through this uh, remote means. Uh, and I'm very pleased to introduce uh, um, Dr. Enrico Manlapig to you. Before I do, let me just say a word of appreciation and thanks to the Westmont Foundation for uh, helping to sponsor this event and uh, a word of appreciation to Phil Becky, who's going to be one of the commentators as well. Uh, Dr. Manlapig will be uh, introducing him after his own remarks. So a privilege to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Manlapig. Enrico is an associate professor in the Department of Economics and Business at Westmont. He joined us in 2014. He completed his undergraduate study at the University of Queensland in Australia, then finished two master's degrees and a doctorate in economics from Columbia University in New York. Prior to coming to Westmont, he was at Deloitte Financial Advisory Services and at Price Waterhouse Cooper Financial Advisory Service Services, and, and also taught at um, uh, New York University and then for several years at Hope College in, in Michigan. I've always appreciated Enrico's problem solving ability and determination. I should say that the provost's office this uh, summer was in deeply and great grateful to him because we had to reinvent the entire academic schedule uh, to accommodate with new uh, COVID restrictions and Enrico came up with formulas and, and, and various templates that were enormously helpful to us uh, in seeking solutions, so I'm grateful at that level. Uh, we celebrated Enrico's uh, gift, a uh, receipt of tenure recently uh, at a faculty uh, meeting. And at that time we prepared a statement that I think captures uh, a lot of his spirit and uh, I'd like to, to read it to you at this time. It says, Enrico makes demands of his students but none harder than the demands he makes of himself. He cares about students' learning. Their command of the material, their alertness to the moral dimensions of what they're learning. Enrico is a teacher in the classroom and a teacher among colleagues. He has that rare blend of academic rigor and generosity of spirit. And he's willing at a moment's notice to bring his creativity and analytical skills to help others in their initiatives and endeavors. You ask him for advice, and he may give you a good critique, but it always feels like a gift. It's been a, a real gift to work with Enrico this year, uh, many years, and uh, I'm grateful to be able to welcome him to our podium this evening. Enrico. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to the, the Westmont Foundation for sponsoring this talk and making this possible. I'm um, so glad that you're here. Um, so the title of this talk um, is Decision Analysis and the Common Good. The subtitle that I was too shy to, to put out there was what I learned from Pokemon and other board games. You see, during quarantine, my family has been playing a lot, and I mean a lot of board games. We take turns each night choosing a game, and now after, what, eight months, nine months, hundreds and hundreds of days at home, um, we have played a lot of games. Each person has their favorites, and each person has their own particular style of play. My wife, she's like a silent assassin, unassuming, friendly, helpful, and she will smile so innocently while she destroys you. My eldest, he's a master strategist who studies the board game, he studies the rule book, he studies every card and every piece to exploit every option and alternative available to him. He's also an incessant commentator. My youngest, he's like an overzealous rhino, slowly building his strength with each turn and then unleashing it all to just blow up everybody's expectations and plans. I like Yahtzee and games where you commit to gambles and you get to play with chance. As we acquire new games and we play them, I've come to notice something about our thinking and the way that we learn a new game. When we first get a new game, we read the instructions. We play a few rounds, we set up the board. Everything's all a little bit awkward. My youngest, the rhino, um, he usually wins a lot because he applies brute force and reckless abandon. 
But in a few days, my eldest has fully dissected the rule book, the game board, the cards, the pieces. He's been studying it each night in bed. And he begins to recognize new ways to play. He starts to appreciate how pieces can be combined together to create new options, and how options create positions of strength and safety. He starts winning a bunch of games. After that, my wife and I start copying them. We start learning from what they're doing. My wife starts to refine their strategies, and she wraps it all in her trademark deception. And she starts stringing wins together, too. I like watching how information leaks out. You watch how people behave, and you try and work out what they're trying to do. And then I modify my strategy to foil them. If I read them really well, then I can win big. But most of the time, I lose, because I don't read them that well. We also learn a lot from our post-game analyses. You missed this opportunity. You got unlucky. How did you know that I wanted that piece? You could play better if you thought about the pieces in this way. When we're done, our brains are tired from all the mental exertion, but we enjoy our time together. And after a few weeks of this, we're all better, we're all more nuanced, and we're more competitive players. So what happened? Did we get smarter? No. We've just grown in under our understanding of the game. We understand now the real objectives of the game, the real sub-objectives of the game. We understand the power of our alternatives and how they go about achieving these goals. We understand the value of the information that we're hiding and the information that we're learning from others. We see these things with greater clarity and in ways that we didn't appreciate when we first started to play. Beyond board games, this kind of clarity of thought and action is actually helpful in lots of situations. Think about students that are really good at school. They don't just try to get A's. They realize that they're sub-objectives. You have to perform consistently throughout the semester. They recognize and exploit the resources available to them. Their class time, their homework, their instructors, their readings, their preparation. They control their calendars. They control their time to mitigate risk. People that are good with money do the same thing. They don't just try to get more money. They have sub-objectives. They, they set savings goals. They have investment goals. They recognize there's different ways to make money work for them. They create budgets to build positions of safety and strength. And they plan for rainy days and diversify to manage their risks. See, here's the thing. When you see the contours and you feel the textures of your decision context, the better decisions you're going to make. And to the extent that your life is the sum of the decisions you make, then making better decisions can quite literally make your life better. This is obviously something we want for our students. It's what I want for my students. At Westmont, we're preparing students for lives of faithfulness and leadership, service, and global engagement. We want them to think well and decide well. But this is much easier said than done. Think about the board game. When it's all over, and you walk away and you put away the pieces, do you notice how your thinking goes back to how it was before? Do you feel your decision muscles relaxing? Do you feel yourself slipping back into your familiar roles and cultures and contexts? When you're back in the real world, the force of culture is often pushing against good decision making. As an example, think about when you go to work. You know you're supposed to make value-oriented decisions, but our values quickly get muddied by the culture of our workplaces. Our mission gets tangled up with our credibility, our success, and our comfort. We know we're supposed to seek creative alternatives to tough problems, but as we grow more experience, we rely more and more on the tools and processes and ideas that worked in the past. These are the things that are going to make us look competent and reliable. And as we climb the corporate ladder and take on more responsibility, we forget that our corner of the organization is only one part of a diverse portfolio of decisions that collectively mitigates risk leads to corporate success and human flourishing. 
And this is just the workplace. Think about decision making in governments, at your church, in your family. The force of culture is strong, which makes practicing good decision making really hard. And this is a big test for us as, decision, as educators. And at this moment in time, clarity of thought, clarity of action has probably never been more important. So how do we go about getting to clarity of thought? How do we strengthen those decision-making muscles that we feel when we play Othello? We can take classes, but you know, few schools actually teach how to make decisions well. Even in our department, many classes have an angle or a perspective on the decision-making challenge. Economics is the language of value and choice. Statistics is the language of risk. Game theory is the language of strategy, and so on. It turns out there is a field, a small one, that brings these fields into a coherent whole. It's called decision analysis, or DA for short. And it's the centerpiece of everything that I do at Vesson, and a unifying framework for how I navigate the world. And I want to share with you what DA thinking is, because it can quite literally change the course of your life. DA begins with an attitude towards decision making. The better you play, the better your outcomes, the more likely you are to win. So don't focus on the winning. Focus on playing well. Recognize that you can play really, really well, and you can still lose. Or you can play mindlessly, like a rhino that I know, and sometimes you'll win. Judge your play by the clarity of your thoughts. Focus on making good decisions, and good outcomes will follow. Now, another part of, making, of having an appropriate attitude towards decision making is recognizing that you're actually making a decision. I'd like to suggest that you declare your decisions. I am making a decision now. In a game, it's pretty easy, because it's your turn, then it's my turn, so you always know when it's your turn to make a choice. But outside of the game, it's a lot harder. It's so easy to walk through life taking and rejecting opportunities without making any decisions. Actually, my first job was kind of like this. I just rolled out of college and took the first opportunity that was there. Um, I didn't understand what I was doing. Um, I didn't decide. I just chose. Don't do this. No one will tell you it's your turn to choose. It's your turn to make a decision. But it is. And at the moment you make the decision, right? the moment you've declared the decision, you suspend your judgment to do some hard thinking. Now, what kind of thinking are you talking about? Well, decision analysis asks us to lead with values. This means front-loading your decisions with honest, careful reflection about what it is that you want. It asks us to reflect on your priorities, your intentions, and your goals. What is it that's really important to you? Research shows that we don't recognize all of our values at any given time. In fact, we're only conscious of a small portion of our values and that what's really important lies somewhere in our subconscious. As, as an example from a game, to win at Pokemon, you're going to need a big, powerful Pokemon right, to beat up the opponent. But you also have to have energy to power your Pokemon. And you need cards that are, give you are going to give you access to energy and Pokemon when you need them. That's already three values, right? And there's a lot more than this. So ask for each value. Why is this important? Why is this important? Why is that important? Identify what needs to happen in order for these things to be achieved. These are means to ends, but they're still objectives. Leading with values also means recognizing trade-offs. In a 60-deck Pokemon card deck, more energy means less space for Pokemon and less space for trainer cards. The A student is always trading up between socializing and studying devoting time to studying finance or studying English. The personal finance investor uh, is trading off a fancy dinner tonight with a holiday tomorrow or perhaps a more comfortable retirement down the road. DA thinking also asks us to, to create distinct and viable alternatives. It's a simple fact that you cannot choose something that you're unaware of. 
research shows that when you understand your values, you're going to create better and more alternatives. So reflect on your values and ask, what's within my control? What can I do to advance my values, respond to threats, and create options for myself in the future? Top students recognize alternatives when they approach an assignment. They don't just look at the deadline, but they see the space before the deadline as an opportunity for research, for practice, and revision. They see opportunities to take more value from lectures by turning up early, by reading the chapter, by asking questions and engaging with the material. You cannot choose an alternative you haven't identified. So use your values to identify and create alternatives that advance them. DA thinking also involves identifying what we know and what we need to know before making a decision. It doesn't mean that you have to know everything before making a decision, but it recognizes that some things are out of our control and are legitimate threats to value. Certainly, data and statistics help here, certainly. But it's not all about the data. If you think about your most important decisions, um, oftentimes there is no data. That's because you've never faced it before or it's never been, it's completely new, completely novel. Oftentimes all you have is a subjective belief or someone's opinion. The goal here is, is relevant and reliable information. So use these. Armed with these tools, an appropriate attitude towards a declared decision, an understanding of your values and trade-offs, distinct and viable alternatives, relevant and reliable information, you are in a good position to make a good decision. Again, this is so much easier to say than it is to do. Just think about this time of COVID and election and racial injustice and civil unrest and deep division and harsh economic realities. At this very moment, getting our attitude right is hard. Obtaining relevant and reliable information is really hard. Creating um, viable alternatives and policies is also really hard. Our collective decision making is being tested. And it's never important, been more important to decide well. I do want to say that it's hard to teach good decision making to students too. For young people who are only a few years out of high school, it's hard for them to appreciate how big and important some of these ideas are. In many ways, school is kind of like a game with clear choices, clear rules, and clear goals. How can we teach them to make good decisions that stand up to the force of culture when the world is much less clear? Well, thinking back to the game again, reading the manual is not enough to make you a good player. To learn the nuances and the texture of the game, you have to play. I'm teaching my students to use decision analysis to make hard decisions, and certainly we read the manual. But to really see those contours and feel those textures, um, I want them to do DA as well. I call it the Westmont Decision Lab, and it's a living laboratory for making high quality decisions. At the lab, we partner with local organizations to support real decisions of real importance. We support some of the toughest decisions our community faces, like fighting homelessness, thinking through affordable housing, affordable childcare, supporting student success, and more. Students work alongside decision makers at the highest levels of the organization. They try to foster an appropriate attitude towards decision making and bring clarity of thought by eliciting values and objectives, creating value-focused alternatives, focused alternatives, and identifying relevant and reliable information. I love, love, love this model of education. It's professional de development, for sure. Our students become better professionals, better thinkers as a result. But it's also missional. We're training students for lives of leadership and service. We're preparing them to engage the world professionally, socially, and civically by teaching them and modeling them for them what good decision making looks like. But it's good for our community too. Ultimately, we want Santa Barbara, our community and our home to make decisions well. 
while learning to make decisions well ourselves. Economists talk about the common good of education, and this ordinarily refers to the fact that we graduate liberally educated students into society. And DA serves this, this good, this common good, no question. But through activities like the Decision Lab, it's like a super common good. We don't need to wait for students to graduate to benefit society, but our students go out and change society today. I would love to share in more detail what decision analysis can do for individuals and societies. And I'm privileged um, to have Bill Beckew, an alum of the college and legend in this field of decision analysis to show you what it looks like. I'll give you an introduction. Phil Beckew is a founder and principal of White Deer Partners, Inc., a consulting firm that specializes in quantitative analytics applied to strategic business problems. Phil's area of expertise is in the application of decision analysis, using various tools to help people make decisions by developing metrics that help quantify the level of achievement of stakeholder concerns and, when appropriate, managing risk and uncertainty. This is broadly applicable to any strategic decision or prioritization, whether business strategy, human or financial resource allocation, capital investment, promotional strategy, or personal decision. Phil was part of the 3-2 dual degree program at Westmont and received his engineering and management science degrees from Stanford. Phil has authored numerous journal articles, serves an adjunct faculty at Northwestern Law School, and has developed and taught decision analysis and multi-objective decision-making seminars for a wide range of public and private audiences. So, welcome, Phil. We're delighted to have you. Um, would you please describe how you've seen and used decision analysis to help people serve the common good? Thank you very much, Enrico. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to talk about uh, a topic that's uh, most exciting for me uh, as I spent most of my career on these, and it's really changed my life. Enrico talked about how you can change students' lives. Well, way back when I was a student, I I uh, was uh, exposed to this field and uh, it just uh, really kind of rang true to me and uh, it's like, yeah, this is what I want to do. And I, I've been uh, fortunate to be able to help uh, government, as, as the bio mentioned, uh, you know, public policy questions, biotech, uh, personal decisions. And today I want to give you an example of what Enrico was talking about um, in, um, in an area called Business for Transformation. And it kind of highlights a lot of the principles that he was referring to. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so I'm still involved with a uh, large corporation in the US, but I also have time to volunteer um, uh, with uh, a whole set of these organizations. So B for T, Business for Transformation, refers to businesses that are located uh, in the developing world mostly, and their express goals is to be profitable, scalable, and to bring holistic, Christ-like transformation to communities. Um, so in, in this network of businesses, uh, we've seen how the more jobs you create, the more hope you bring, and uh, hope, jobs brings dignity, dignity brings respect, respect creates opportunities for those of us in these businesses that are not just to tell the gospel, really to model the gospel to people. And it's really a double bottom line approach, both profit and transformation. And that's something that integrates kind of all aspects of the business together. There's many examples around the world. Um, I helped somebody develop a cheese business in Niger. I just recently worked with a company selling cu sea cucumbers in Indonesia. Uh, I helped someone transfer or, or do IT business in Vietnam coffee shop in Turkey, it's all over the place. Um, and even here at Westmont, uh, in the Emmaus Road uh, summer program, uh, for many years students have gone to Indonesia to help with a uh, tourist hotel business that's using these ideas to bring transformation to those communities. So uh, yeah, very exciting work going on. Today I want to highlight um, just one of these businesses and the decision that they faced uh, that I was able to walk them through. So Swali is the name of a Northeastern India company that employs vulnerable women to make women's dresses that's geared for the international market. So you can see on the slide, the, those are the actual women in this small business. They have eight employees. 
and um, they've been around for a number of years, but they really are barely breaking even right now. But the vision of Swali um, is to, uh, grew out of two simple desires, and the owner uh, had this as she um, started this business, it was to craft modern classic dresses out of the beautifully textured material of cotton and silk handloom fabrics that are so integral to India's heritage, and also to create jobs for young people, particularly women in Northeast India who otherwise would leave the region in search of work elsewhere. And, and really these women, um, because of the lack of jobs and the, the, the situation that they're in, uh, often find themselves in prostitution or uh, other uh, areas of, of trade and they've been rescued and now these are a chance to give these women meaningful work. And um, so uh, for just for this company to have long-term sustainability, the owner agreed to step back with me and have a strategic lens to take a look carefully at um, ways to adjust the business focus because she was actually having a lot of difficulty finding a local manager and realize that the business wouldn't survive without her. So Enrico just mentioned about the, how we need to sometimes declare a decision. So this is exactly what this business owner did. Uh, so, so she has a decision to make about what to do with her business. Well, research shows that decisions are usually made when we recognize a decision problem and we try to solve it by looking at one or more alter alternatives and then we evaluate the alternatives and pick the best one. But that's the wrong way to look at decision problems. The right way to do it, uh, decisions should be made much differently than that. First, as Enrico mentioned, you do serious thinking about your values, what you want to achieve, uh, about wh why it's worth thinking about a decision in the first place. And then the values guide everything else, uh, including the identification of good alternatives. So um, we started then with the values. And uh, these included, of course, financial values because, again, the whole premise of this, uh, of this B4T work is to be both profitable and transformative. And uh, so, but you can see from this hierarchy that there are um, financial values as well as transformation values, um, quantity and safety of jobs, uh, the ability to find uh, staff uh, and keep skilled staff, sustainability as well as minimizing startup costs. So we actually just had a long discussion about values, brainstormed quite a few of them, organized them, and uh, tried to highlight the most important ones that were really relevant for her business. So then after the values were highlighted, we moved to alternatives. And I have a, a page that shows the different business options. Um, so again, the order of this is so important, I can't stress it enough. Have we started off with just looking at the business options first, um, the owner could have been anchored or biased on ideas that are, uh, that are more available or recent to her. Maybe she just heard about something, maybe she met someone in town, and oh, here's another business idea you could do. Uh, maybe someone wrote her an email from the state saying, oh, try this, why don't you, right? So, but reflecting on her values first gave her the opportunity to reflect more broadly on the alternatives that made sense for her, right? So you can see on the slide that the first seven are different variations of the dress business, uh, either local or exporting markets, that using developing your own brand or manufacturing uh, for other brands. And then she had a whole n another list of completely different business ideas, commercial cleaning, Running, storing children's parties, running a bakery, an eco lodge, uh, a clean food store, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so the idea is with the decision analysis framework is we bring these options as well as the values into an integrated framework that's uh, then compelling. And we can show how each alternative achieves the values that are uh, ultimately more impor important for you. So the next question then is how did we measure the achievement of these business options to her values. Um, so some objectives are quite easy to measure. Um, think about operating margin or profit. They might be hard to forecast over the long term because of the uncertainty, but they're easy to measure. You measure them in dollars or whatever currency that's relevant for you. But there's other objectives that are much more difficult to measure. And so for those, we created scales, constructed scales, 
which consisted of roughly three or four descriptions of different degrees to which the objective uh, is met. And then we carefully designed those scales so that they differentiate among the alternatives. So one of the objectives was safety for the workers. And so the scale that we developed together was, uh, one, the first level was there was a self-contained workspace, and the second level was a supervised workspace with some exposure to potential predators, and the third is unsupervised workspace with a lot of exposure to potential predators. So then as, we, as, sh as the owner thought through her business options, she could uh, determine which level on that scale they would fall under. Then after the scales were created, I, I asked some trade-off questions to infer the owner's opinion about the relative importance of each value compared to the others. And then finally, we scored the business alternatives against the scales with a simple decision analytic formula to help capture the overall value. And from that, we were able to rank or the results. And so here's a colorful bar chart that shows the actual results for this business. Um, so a, a, a larger bar is more preference and a smaller bar is less preference. And the colors within the bars show the uh, contribution to overall preference. So, uh, so this gave uh, the owner a lot of insight as to how the different options compared as she was thinking about how she was going to move forward. Um, and it, it really, the doing this, uh, this work helped her kind of accomplish two key benefits. So one is she readjusted her business model to focus on new markets and a different mix of products. And then she also took a deeper dive on the, the top three on this list that um, to see which ones could really uh, be best for long-term sustainability. I was really, uh, really glad to see her do that and super impressed, not just by her passion to significantly help vulnerable women, but also her humility and her courage to explore completely new ideas, which she probably wouldn't have done without the additional clarity that this kind of decision analysis exercise uh, afforded for her. Well, for many decision problems, there's lots of assumptions that go in, and this is a, a challenge that, uh, that I face with uh, decision makers and teams that I work with. Um, one of the values for, uh, for Swally was financial profitability, of course. And for this, uh, for this metric, for this value, we looked deeper at production time for each dress. We looked at all, in fact, there's a whole set of values that go into profitability for the business. So it's dress production time, material costs, marketing expense, how you're gonna price the product, where you're gonna sell it, many, many values. And uh, this next chart, which has the shape of our tornado, we actually call it a tornado chart as a slang turn, really shows the sensitivity to the bottom line profit uh, metric uh, against all these variables. So what we did is we took each variable and put a range across it. Like, we don't know uh, some of these variables, uh, but we do have a sense for how small they could be or how large they could be. So we put a range on each one, and then we one by one exercise it against a profit model. And so we could see which one uh, impacted profit the most. So the ones at the top on this chart uh, are the really the drivers of uncertainty in terms of her business. And she realized, especially that you can see that the very top one is production time. So how long does it take to make uh, each dress? Um, and so um, that's a key business driver that she was really focused on to uh, work with the, the staff to increase, increase that and just to be more efficient at uh, what, the, what they were doing. So, well, these, these types of analysis bring many benefits I've seen uh, throughout my career uh, for all kinds of organizations and businesses. Um, so in addition to pointing decision maker to a path that best meets their values, it also documents the rationale for why decisions are made because you need to communicate with, uh, many times with owners, with investors, with team members. It also helps facilitate communication among people that are working within the team and, uh, and other stakeholders. Uh, it gives you the sense of reasons why we would do the B4D business. Just laying out the values communicates to others, like this is, this is what this business is about. You know, we're about transformation, we're about Quanti you know, making more jobs and about safety, all those things are just like explicit and actually measured and counted uh, in the decision that's, that was made. 
It also allows for an efficient way and a focused way to have check-in times in the future. Now we've laid out all these values and we're gonna go down this path now, three months from now, 12 months from now, we can go back and see how are we doing against our values. Um, has anything changed? What, which part are we weak on? How can we improve? So those kinds of things. And then of course, by, by explicitly creating a decision model, it helps you to easily update as information changes. Maybe in a year, new alternatives show up, values uh, are adjusted, and uh, so these things can be easily updated. Well, um, I hope that uh, this uh, example for Swali in India has really inspired you by, to show you the integration of the powerful tools of decision analysis, as well as, uh, and the ability to support businesses that exist for both financial and transformational goals. So thanks for the opportunity to, to be uh, presenting at this forum. Thank you, Phil. Um, I've received a couple of questions from the, from the um, participants, and I'll read a couple of them here. Um, perhaps this one's, well, I think we can both opine on both of these, actually. They're, they're both good. So one of them, the easy one is, in your opinion, what areas of society or the economy would benefit most from DA value-oriented decision strategies? all of them. <laughs> um, DA tends to do really, really well when you're in a situation of high uncertainty. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of stuff that you don't know. That's, that's one area which DA handles really well because it asks us to clarify what are the key uncertainties. Um, it also does really well when there are competing values, like when, when um, you can't have everything that you want and you're going to have to make trade-offs. Um, DA does really well at um, describing or, or teasing apart what it is that you want. Um, DA also does really well when alternatives are complicated. Um, I think it's, it's really important at, I can see lots of different areas of government. Public health um, is, is top of mind for me right now. Um, it tends to feature a lot in uh, pharmaceutical research and development as well as um, upstream oil and gas, but any, any area of um, um, High risk, long term capital investment, DA tends to tends to have a lot to say. But broadly, I use DA for personal decisions of all kinds. Um, if they're important and it's worth thinking really hard about, um, I think DA can be really really valuable. You wanna you wanna chime in on that one? Oh, uh, you, you you stole all my thunder, Rodrigo. I oh. think uh, it's especially when you have uh, a l many different stakeholders with different viewpoints and different opinions. I think this is really helpful. And also, in uh, when there's lots of uh, risk and uncertainty, sometimes people are just throwing up their arms and say, "Well, we just don't know anything about something." But this is this is especially a powerful set of processes to help you think through um, uncertainties that are that are not common. I personally want to help people with the most important decisions. So those tend to be the, the big ones in our society, like global sure. warming and all the other ones, right? But uh, uh, and I've had a chance to do some of those. So. Very good. Um, some more questions coming in, which is great. Great. So, um, how does the field of decision analysis interact with the field of negotiations? Hmm. Do you have anything on this one? Well, in negotiations, you're making some, there's, it, there's a back and forth, right? So you're making some moves and then the other side is making some moves and then you're making more moves and then they're making moves. Mm -hmm. And so that can be modeled out uh, with uh, thinking through your choices and the reactions and then your choices again. So uh, uh, we use this for a number of negotiation uh, applications. Yeah. yeah. Howard Rafer has a book on the art of mm -hmm. negotiation, which is, which is precisely about applying decision analysis and negotiation. <coughs> a lot of it's about identifying um, what are your uh, non-negotiable values? Yeah. What, what alternatives do you have to to um, um, to find points of agreement um, where your where your values overlap? Um, a really good question here was, um, in your opinion, what area? Oh, sorry, I did already. I hear echoes of famous of a famous essay in the philosophy of religion, the will to believe. Can decision analysis apply to faith? <laughs> this one, um, I. I'm, this is a really good question. Um, 
and, and I've got lots of lots of answers to it. On the one hand, um, I think decision analysts are very wary about trying to reinforce what you believe. Like we are, it makes us nervous when people tell us, um, I already know the answer, please do analysis that shows us that we, we, we see what we want. Um, that's, that's not a good place. I, I don't think that's an ethical use of, of decision analysis. Um, having said that, decision analysis is a wonderful tool for self-reflection, for, for holding like a mirror to yourself and what it is that you want. Um, I, I've, I use it when, when I was considering going to grad school. It made a lot of sense to go to school in Australia, but I, the more I thought about it, I discovered that I care about the ooh factor of going to an Ivy. Um, and you can weigh that. That turned out to be 50 to 60 times more important to me than any other criteria. So um, decision analysis is a wonderful way of checking your own, um, your own priorities and your own values. You want me to add to that? Add to that. <laughs> DA and well, I remember well. as a student uh, years ago, I, was, uh, I had this firm belief that decision analysis essentially quantifies your values. And uh, so there's two areas where I tend to not want to do the quantification. And one is the decision to believe in God and the decision to get married. If you need to quantify that, then there's... <laughs> However, uh, let's say that uh, Pascal, I think, used these ideas to commit his life to God. So isn't that interesting? So I think different people, I actually have another friend I used to work with who was an atheist when, we worked, when I worked with him, and he used these ideas to become a Christian. And, uh, and he's no turning back. So I think anything's possible. <laughs> Here's a great question for you, Phil. Sure. Um, how did your background in physics help you with your career in DA? Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, again, it, as I just mentioned, it's, it's a quantitative approach to thinking about decision problems. And so we end up constructing mathematical models of different futures. And so having that physics background, I remember my Westmont physics course was the toughest course in my undergrad career here. And, but that gave me some analytical uh, horsepower to really help do manage these, uh, the models that are involved. So some of these, you know, we showed some slides that are pretty simple, but these things can be fairly complex with hundreds of thousands or millions of scenarios that we're looking at, and statistical tools can help kind of manage that and do things efficiently and quickly, and so physics was a great foundation for that. Um, what, if any, challenges do you encounter most often when trying to get people to adopt DA models of thinking? <laughs> do you want to start with this one? I'll start with that one. So. Um, uh, in fact, I teach a two-day course, and so that was, a, it's a key slide at the end, like, why don't people use this more? Well, one reason is I think people don't, it's a very transparent approach to how you get to the optimal choice, and some people don't want their, their, uh, the rationale or their thinking process known. They want, they want to keep that to themselves. So I'm working with, multi, with uh, teams and corporations. This is a challenge that, uh, that uh, actually decision also can really help address by bringing teams together when some people are hiding things. So um, I think another thing is just, uh, it's an unfamiliarity with the process and they, they have this idea. That one, one client just told me yesterday, when you came in a, a, a few years ago, I was, I was so angry and confused. But then, uh, now she's the one who's invited me back to help on this next uh, biotech problem, right? It's like, but after working through it, all of a sudden the clarity came. So there's that initial barrier of thinking it's too much work, I don't understand, I don't know what you're gonna do, and uh, so that can be getting away. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll second that. The, the major challenge that I find to, to having people adopt this kind of thinking um, is their own thinking, um, especially as, as you're higher into the organization. Um, people confuse outcomes with good decision making. I, I have great, great outcomes, I've been really successful in my career, Therefore, I must be a really good decision maker, good point. Um, and that I, that I don't need that sort of help. Um, it's, it's hard to, the buy-in, having, a, having a, um, an advocate can be, can be very helpful. Um, and this is true whether you're in the for-profit or in the non-profit world, I yeah. think. Um, I've had a question about, how does DA deal with social, relational norms or commitments which are notably absent when playing board games? Oh, I talked about board games. You need to answer that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
How does DA deal with social and relational norms or commitments which are notably absent when playing board games? Um, the, I think a lot of the, the early stuff in decision analysis when you're framing the decision problem um, is, is about recognizing what's within your control and what's outside of your control. What are the, what are the parameters in which the decision is going to be made? Um, and oftentimes dealing with social, relational, even regulatory norms, um, these are things that come out as constraints on the decision problem early. Um, it's really important when we're value, we're framing values and identifying values to say that, you know, this is important to me. I want to be um, consistent with this um, norm that our, that, our, that our company follows. I want to be um, consistent with this regulatory requirement. Um, these priorities of being, of, of following norms can be stated up front. Now, to the extent that um, you're going to break these norms, um, because there's some good reason to do it, right? In the analysis, you discover that there's some value to, um, there's an alternative which is going to break a norm, but it's going to get you a lot of value. Um, you should say that, and decision analysis is going to make that um, really, really clear. Do you want to add anything to that one? Or should I? No? That's good. Yeah, good. Um, how about this one? If DA is based on predictive modeling, what happens when the predictive model is upset, such as COVID? Well, uh, right. so uh, a predictive model, uh, uh, so pretend, I, th I think what's behind that is the, the COVID impact is not in the model. And so now we have like a new feature. And uh, yeah, so you, how can you put, you can't put everything in the model, right? So, but, but, uh, but what the best you can do is think about the information you know now and the choices that you have going forward. And as time evolves, New information comes apparent. Now COVID's on the scene. Now we have new uncertainties to think about. Yes, exactly. But yeah, this is, it's not a tool that can predict the future perfectly. It just is a tool to kind of manage your information and the uncertainty around it and the choices that you have as well as your values. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd really say that it's about, um, it's about achieving clarity of thought mm -hmm. and clarity of, clarity of action. Um, but it's not a, a magic bullet that it's going to predict something new. Yeah, and if the information changes, then you respond to it. I mean, it. people want to ask me about, like, where should they invest in the stock market? Mm -hmm. And we can think about the risk and uncertainty about different investments, but I can't guarantee that your stock's going to win, right? So that's just, uh, if I could, then I would not be here today. I'd be doing on a beach <laughs> somewhere, right? <laughs> that's right. All right, so we are done. We're out of time, but I want to thank you for these questions. Um, thank you for, your, for attending. Uh, thank you to the Westmont Foundation for sponsoring this event. Um, have a great evening and a wonderful holiday.